very self-righteous, prideful kind of people. Right? I mean, they would look down on others who didn't measure up to them and didn't measure up to their standards, their idea, right, at least, of, of the standards of spiritual success. That's what the Pharisees did. And, and so today we're talking a bit about the curse of comparison is kind of what we're talking about. Um, you know, guys, when, when Karen and I lived in Odessa, Texas, and we did, we lived in Texas the first 14 years of our life and ministry, all of our kids were born in Odessa, Texas, and when we lived there, um, I spent about 10 years, almost 10 years, helping out with the, uh, the YMCA um, kids sports area, the YMCA there. The, um, I kind of got to help run the sports for the kids. Uh, a guy there named, by the name of Dub was a friend of mine, and so I helped him out. I helped organize. I coached. I did a whole lot of refereeing of kids' sports. And, and I would referee or umpire all ages in, in basketball, in t-ball, in machine pitch, you know, baseball, flag football, all of that. But one of my favorite things I got to ref um, was the four- to six-year-old soccer, all right? And I, and I grew up playing soccer and basketball, so soccer was, was a love of mine. And so I really enjoyed refing soccer for those four- to six-year-olds. And it was, it was awesome. I mean, some of the kids could barely walk, let alone kick the ball, right, without falling down or something. And it was always a smaller group. It was like six-on-six six or seven-on-seven. Seven. And it was amazed me how oftentimes during the course of the game how all 14 kids would be chasing the ball wherever it was, right? Even the goalies would be gone just chasing the ball. Except maybe not all 14 of them because there were always three or four of them that were running off to their parents on the sideline with that flower, that dandelion they just picked, right? <laughs> to show their mom and dad, or there was that kid who was always sitting in the middle of the field playing with the grass while everybody was running around them, you know. Uh, and it was, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, and I enjoyed it. And I spent most of my time, you know, either helping kids up, tying shoes, right, or trying to help the kids understand a little bit more about soccer, just to teach them the basics. Like, hey, buddy, you can't just pick up the ball and run with it, all right? I mean, put it back down. I mean, that kind of stuff. That was the course of me repping five to eight games on a Saturday, right? Um, and it was, but it was a lot of fun. And, and I guarantee you, I mean, at least I'm pretty sure that there was never a college scout at any of these soccer games, all right? So there were no scholarships on the line. Nothing was that drastic. But, all right, and, and, and we didn't keep score, right? In fact, there was a rule about keeping score. Don't keep it because our goal was for kids to have fun and learn, right? That was, this was a, it's a preschool league. They wanted to learn what it was to do soccer. But I guarantee you, everybody in those stands, they knew the score. All right? Everybody in those stands also knew a whole lot about soccer because they read it somewhere, I think. All right? And so I guarantee you, if, if, if I didn't blow the whistle every time some kid touched the ball with their hand, I'd be getting yelled at from the stands. All right? Or every time um, maybe that a kid would trip over another kid, right? which happened a lot at this age, I get yelled at because I didn't blow the whistle and throw a red card or something. If you don't know think about, it. I mean, it was it was crazy sometimes um, the the amount of energy coming from the stands when it came to these games. It was supposed to be about having fun, right? And sometimes it wasn't. I would get yelled at constantly. And and the thing is, you know, some kid could get tripped because he tripped over another kid who was sitting there picking up the grass again or something. And some parent in the stands would yell at me for not blowing the whistle, and giving a penalty kick. When I know that his kid two minutes ago was over there in the corner picking his nose, right? I mean, that's, that's, this is that soccer. That's what it was. But if the game was tied four to four at the end of the game and somebody scored a goal in the last seconds of the game, the stands would erupt like they just won something, even though we weren't keeping score, right? Officially, right? We weren't keeping score. No, I mean, it was, it was crazy. And I have to admit that working with those sports, and not just soccer, but flag football and basketball and all those things. Working with those sports taught me a lot about the powerful pull of comparison and the dangers that come with comparison. See, we've all done it. You know, we weren't supposed to be keeping score, but we were. And why? Because someone has to be better than everybody else. That's why you keep score. Someone's got to be better. See, and the problem with comparison isn't necessarily the comparing part. Sometimes it's okay to compare because it helps us to learn some things about those about situations and, and to evaluate how we can get better. And sometimes that's good. So it's not the comparing part per se that's the problem. 
The problem is what we do with that information. When we compare we get that information, that's where we can get ourselves into trouble because then we start putting people, ourselves included, into a pecking order because someone has to be up top and someone has to be at the bottom. And we start comparing, we start putting ourselves and others in a pecking order based on what we do, based on what we see, based on what we're evaluating. In those, in those soccer games, it was based on what that kid was doing on the soccer field. All right? If a kid scored three times in a game, his dad's up in the stands going, man, that's my boy. Right? You go, man. That, that's my son. That's right. That's my kid. But if that same kid got hit in the back of the head with the soccer ball while chasing a butterfly, you know, then that parent was just hanging his head in disgust. Like, oh my, I can't believe that's my kid. You know, and, and I look at that and I'm thinking, it's preschool soccer. How can we find self-worth in our kid in preschool soccer? How do we find our self-worth in that? That's ridiculous, right? But we all do it in similar things. We find our self-worth in really little insignificant things. And if you're sitting here right now shaking your head in disgust at those parents for acting that way, well, then you never had a kid score a goal in the last seconds of a game to win the game, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. See, and I think that experience in my life taught me Again, how powerful the natural urge is, that innate urge that we have, all of us, to compare. And how it really can quickly then get us to the point where we are categorizing people as winners or losers based on some really insignificant data. Weakest of reasons. And that's bad enough when we start comparing and using kids' sports, but it's tragic when we start taking that same idea and move it into us comparing our spiritual lives with others and their spiritual lives. Comparing our relationship with Jesus to others and their relationship with Jesus. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did the whole time. They were comparing themselves to others and basing everything on some very insignificant, really weak reasons. And so I want this morning for us to look at a couple of points here to help us avoid that pharisaical attitude when it comes to the problems of comparison. All right? So a couple things. One, number one is this, the, com the problem with spiritual comparisons. Let's just look at the problem in general. The problem with spiritual comparisons, because they're there. All right? And when we start comparing ourselves to others spiritually, I'm telling you right now, it's just, it's just silly to do it that way. Because we're comparing ourselves to someone that we really don't know anything about except for what we see on the surface. We don't know the whole story of anybody in this room. All right? Your spouse, maybe your kids, okay, you know a lot, but you don't know the whole story of others in this room. What you see is on the outside. And when and you can, there's no way for you to see their heart. There's no way for you to see their history and their relationship with Jesus Christ, how they even got to this point. You don't know their whole story. All you can see is the outside. And so when you start doing that, that means most of your observations your conclusions are flat wrong because you don't know what's really going on in their heart. Remember, now the Pharisees, right, they looked very impressive on the outside, but they were dead on the inside, spiritually. I mean, let's face it, they, they had it all going on for them. They, they knew all the rules. They knew the Scripture. They went to church. They prayed. They did all these things. And so if you compared yourself to what they looked like on the outside, we're all going to fall short. But they were dead on the inside. They looked good on the outside, not on the inside. And when we compare ourselves spiritually, let's face it, we're all biased, right? You're going to put yourself in, the, in some sort of a category so you always will come out on top. You'll always look better than the other person. We have that amazing ability to only compare things that will make us look good. I'm not going to compare it any other way. I want to compare something that makes me look good in the end, right? And when I come out... On top, it's pretty easy then to start looking down on everybody else around me that doesn't measure up to that one area maybe in my life. That's when pride becomes dangerous. And we're going to talk a lot about pride this morning. It's, it can become dangerous. See, and one of the big problems with pride most of the time is that we don't look at it as that big of a deal. In our society, we don't look at it as that big of a deal. Yes, it can be a problem, but it's just a small one. You know, it falls somewhere between failing to floss and driving too fast, right? So somewhere in that area. It's not that serious. We may need to work on it, right? But it's not going to send me to prison or anything, so it's not that big of a deal. 
And even if we struggle with periodic bouts of pride, right? Well, most of us think as well, you know, it's kind of tough staying humble when I'm, well, look at me, you know? I mean, that's, and then pride just kicks in there. So I want to go to Proverbs chapter 6. And, and I want to look at um, just a little portion of Scripture here. We'll go to a couple other Scriptures throughout the, here in the next few minutes. But in Proverbs 6, we see the beginning, you know, at the beginning of this chapter of Proverbs 6, the writer is encouraging his readers to avoid trouble, right? Stay out of trouble. Um, try not to get into trouble. Here's some ways to avoid it, all right? But, so, but then he gets to verse 16, and he gives us some examples of some things that God hates. Proverbs 6, verse 16 says, There are six things that the Lord hates. Okay, you get that? Six things the Lord's, that the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. And here's, some, here's the list. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Okay? Six things that he hates. Seven things that are detestable to him. But did you get that? The top of the gods, I hate that list. What was it? Haughty eyes. Pride. That's the top of this list. Looking down on others in disdain and disgust or with arrogance. Now look, there's a lot of things that I, if I was going to sit down and make a list of things I think God would hate, right? there's a lot of things I could put on there. But I really doubt that I would have put pride at the top of that list. I mean, look at the rest of that list. I mean, there's murder. There's lying. There's people who rush to do evil, people who stir up conflict. All those things are on that list. But pride is at the top of that list. See, many of us would never think that looking down on others would be the top of that kind of a list. And let me say something that, that may be tough to hear here, maybe for some of us, especially those of us that may be struggling with pride in our lives. But if this passage really means what it says, that there is, there's a list of seven things God hates and pride's at the top of that, that's really what it says, then God would rather we struggle with stealing than with pride. He'd rather we struggle with cursing than with pride. He'd rather we, he'd rather we struggle with porn than pride. I don't you see that? On the, it, pride is the top of that list. And we can't just brush it off and it's not that big of a deal. It's just something that I, I'll deal with. It's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. We can't just br brush it off. It's a very big deal. And because of that, those problems with spiritual comparisons, we go to the next point here, because then there, because we start doing that, we start comparing, then there is these unexpected danger zones, this unexpected danger zone, okay? Because here's the scariest part of this whole thing, I think. I've noticed, I've noticed that, the, that this sin, this sin of pride, the sin of comparison, is usually found most in those people who think they love God the most, all right, you get that? Sometimes pride is found most in those people who think they love God the most. You know, we go back a few weeks to that example, right? I, I talked about the spiritual line, right? So if, if people are coming into a relationship with Christ, and here's the line, all right? Here's the line. They walk into this. They cross the line of entering into a relationship with Christ. They've now entered into that relationship, right? They love Jesus. Jesus loves them. They're now a son or a daughter of Christ, all right? Well, some people that cross that line... They don't just stop right there. They make another step because they, they, they hear a verse or a song or they go to a conference or whatever, a message, and they get convicted. They make a choice. Then they make another choice, and they keep making some really good, good choices in their lives, and they get to the front of the following Jesus line, right? And they're up here, and they're doing good things, and they're serving in church, and they're loving the community. And they're doing awesome stuff, and then they turn around and look back at those people who entered this relationship at the same time they did, and they're still back there. And they're thinking, what's wrong? What, what's wrong with those guys? How come they're not moving like I'm moving? How come they're not growing like I'm growing? How come they're not moving forward, moving up like I'm moving up? And they start turning around and they start looking down on them. Why? Because they're comparing their spiritual walk to their spiritual walk. So yeah, they look good, but then they look bad back here. You know, pride is not a back-of-the-line spiritual struggle, right? It's not the back of the following Jesus line. It's the front of the following Jesus line. That's where it becomes a struggle. And it can become a sin. 
And I think it's a hazard to all those who have that, that zealous faith, that serious discipleship, that biblical knowledge, those spiritual frontliners. It can become a hazard to them and a struggle to them when they turn around and look at those behind them and that pride thing can step to the forefront and really change how they do effective relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's take a practical example of this kind of thinking. Look, when I was in high school, junior high and high school, I played a lot of basketball. That was my sport. I loved basketball. And I was, and I was good. All right, my high school years, I was good. I was living in Delaware at the time. We had a, a, a private league, a school, private school league that we were in. And we were a good team. We won our championship my junior and senior year. I was the high scorer in our league those last, those two years. I led an assist. I mean, we, our team won a lot of games. We were a good team. We were a good team. And I thought I was the man when it came to basketball because I was the star of my team, right? I was good. And I would look at others with less talent than me, like my little brother who was on the team too, but don't tell him I said that, all right? And I looked down on them, right, and their talent. I had some haughty eyes. Then I went to college. And I forgot to play basketball in college, in my, in my, in my uh, Bible college I went to. And I was able to play for them, and it was great. But the, the year that I made the team, there was another guy that was on the team um, named Larry Brown, same age as I was, came in the same year I was, and I was good, but Larry was great, all right? I mean, he was great. I spent the next three years sitting on the bench because Larry was so good. Oh, well, I'd get in the game every once in a while when we were way ahead or way behind, right? I'd get in the game, all right? I guarantee you, help your, it helps your prideful attitude. I'm not near as prideful sitting at the five people down from the coach on the bench, as I was the star of the show. I didn't have to deal with pride so much then. It just changes things, the front of the line to the back of the line. We have to be so careful when we get to a place where we're doing well spiritually. we got to be careful because then we need to be an example. Then we need to be investing in others. But it's so hard to sometimes not turn around and then look with haughty eyes at those around us, to look down on those who aren't where we are. Spiritual com comparison can get us into great trouble. There's a lot of danger zones there. Number three, the ultimate reward killer. All right? Look at this, guys. Comparison, pride, it can be the ultimate reward killer. See, all of us, as we're living our lives and we're following Christ, we're, we're earning rewards in heaven, right? We just are. There's things that God has, has promised us. How you live your life, you're going you're gonna to earn some rewards in heaven. But looking down on others, I think, is the ultimate reward killer. We may live a life full of good deeds, righteous living, but if we're living a life of pride, it's going to cancel all that out. And Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells a parable to help us understand the idea of this, to understand the illustration of what this will look like. And this may be a story you're familiar with in Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. Let's read this, and then we'll talk about it real quick. But it says, To some... Now get this, this is what we're talking about. He said, this is who Jesus is talking to. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Okay, so this is the crowd he's talking to. A crowd of people who were very, very prideful of their own spiritual success and their own spiritual walk, and they were looking down on everyone else. This is who he's talking to. Okay, and here's the story he tells them. He told this parable. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee, right, that religious zealot of God and the other, a tax collector, who during this time and our time the next few weeks are not very friendly people we don't like, right? Okay? Tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Here's what Jesus says. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Two men, two completely different walks of life when it came to the spiritual walk of life. And one man... The Pharisee, who we again, if we were to look at him on the outside, we would think he was a religious giant, right? He'd be the one up front. He would be the one coming up on stage to pray his prayer, to make sure everybody heard him because he, he knew he knew how to pray. and He could influence others on how to pray and 
He was full of biblical knowledge. He had tons of spiritual discipline, right? He was zealous for God and the things of God. And when he went to church to pray, he was overwhelmed with all that he had accomplished, right? He was overwhelmed with it. And he began to thank God that he wasn't like other people, right? He didn't rob. He didn't do evil. He didn't sleep around. He tithed. He fasted. He did all the spiritual things you're supposed to do. He was a good man. And it was all true. He was a good man. He was morally excelling in his life. His confidence in himself wasn't just him blowing smoke. It was real. Right? Then there's this other guy who he walked in the church doors, probably didn't even make it into the auditorium. He stands in a corner somewhere in a hallway because he's so embarrassed of who he is in his life. He's a loser. Let's just be honest. He didn't have anything to offer God. In fact, as a tax collector during this time period, he was, he was dishonest, most likely. He was unscrupulous. He would charge exorbitant taxes to his own people, the Jews. And he would pocket most, a lot of it and then give the rest of it to the Romans. I mean, he was, he was a traitor to his own people. And as he prayed, he was, so, he was so ashamed of himself, he couldn't even look up to God to pray. He stood in the corner and he cried out for mercy. That's what he did. Two completely different prayers here. And we see in verse 13, you go back to verse 13, it says, But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up into heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And what did Jesus say about that guy compared to the Pharisee? He says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. This tax collector, he got what he asked for, mercy. He asked for mercy. He asked for grace. Now, I want you to notice something, though, about this, all right? I don't want you to miss this. There is no indication that this guy, this tax collector, cleaned up his life before he came to church, okay? He didn't get things right so that he could feel worthy enough to walk into church. He came into church messed up. He came into church a sinner. He came into church needing God, needing the grace and the mercy of God. He didn't, he didn't change anything to get there. He got there, he asked for mercy, and then God says in Scripture, Jesus says, he was given that. But see, guess what? There's also nothing that states that this, that this guy changed who he was. He walked in a tax collector. Guess what? He walked out a tax collector. Yeah, Jesus says that God heard his prayer. On the other hand, the Pharisee, the guy who had it all going on for himself spiritually, he lived such an extraordinary life that he was now looking down on others, especially that tax collector. He didn't have that same reaction from God. In fact, God ignored his prayers. Don't miss that. According to Jesus, it didn't matter how zealous, how moral, how righteous the Pharisee was, but because of his trust in his own righteousness, it canceled everything else out. His own knowledge canceled everything else out because he was looking down on others. It nullified all the good things he had done. It had nothing to do with his heart. It had everything to do with his outward appearance. That, co that comparison got him into trouble. It was a reward killer. So number four, last thing. So who's on your list? Here's where it gets close to home. Who's on your list? And this is what I mean. Because guys, arrogance can be the ultimate blind spot when it comes to spiritual walk with God. It can be the ultimate blind spot in our lives. See, we very seldom see ourselves as arrogant. We may struggle with pride and admit to that every once in a while. Yeah, we deal with periodic struggles, but I'm never going to have full-blown arrogance, right? We don't inappropriately look down on others. That's what arrogance would be. But let me ask you a question. Do you have a thank God I'm not like them list? Okay, the Pharisee did. He said, thank God I'm not like, and he listed them. How many of us have that kind of a list? And you're thinking, well, I don't have that kind of a list. But, but I want you, guys, I have to look at my life regularly, all right, in order to make sure I don't, I don't get myself into this trouble of having this kind of a list. Because if, you, if I have to look at my life regularly to see if there's that, that group of people, maybe a group of believers even, or non-believers, whom I am beginning to develop this knee-jerk reaction, this knee-jerk response of maybe disgust when I hear something about them, or disdain, or contempt about them because I hear it and I automatically think, oh man, that's I can't believe and that's a knee-jerk response. I've got this list. Maybe you do too. 
You know, for you, maybe you're, you're passionate about justice, okay? I know we have some in here today that are passionate about justice, right? And maybe you have a passion about the needs of the poor, uh, the orphans. And you struggle with those who aren't as passionate as you are. In fact, you may look at them and you want to write them off as maybe uninformed or maybe selfish or even cold-hearted because they don't care the way you care. You probably got them on your list. Maybe you you live green, right? Maybe you're great at recycling. You care for the planet. And that's great things. But then you start looking around you and you look down on those who don't care about the planet as much as you do. You've got a list. Maybe you spend more time than most thinking deeply about religious things, right? Maybe theology or doctrine. You, you do your personal Bible study in the original Hebrew or Greek, right? And that's impressive. I have no clue what you'd be doing there, right? And then, and then you look at someone who says, hey, I, I want to open the Bible to Psalms 23, and you look at them like, Psalms. It's Psalm 23. You know, it's the book of Psalms. Each one is an individual psalm. See, some of you guys don't even know that, right? Okay. No, I mean, seriously. And, and, and you look at that, and you look down on others. Well, see, guys, the same idea goes for those of you who identify yourself maybe as spirit-led, or you're missional, or you are gospel-centered, or some other good churchy word that's out there right now, right? And you then find it hard to not look down on those who don't even know what those words mean. We all kind of have these lists. I don't know what you struggle with. I don't know who it is that's on your list. But most of us have a list of some sort. We just do. And I'm telling you right now, this is a list because of the comparison, because of the pride, because of the haughty eyes. This is a list you've got to destroy. Not just put it on a shelf underneath something to hide it. No, you got to destroy it. you got to burn it. you got to nuke it. Get rid of it. Right? We go to 1 John chapter 1, and we all have heard the verse 1 John 1, 9. But I want us to look at 1 John 1, 8 as it, as it ties into 1 John 1, 9. Okay? Because many of us know the verse, but we don't ever read verse 8. Because what's 1 John 1, 9 say? It's not up there. What's it say? Anybody know 1 John 1, 9 says? If we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Right? We know that verse. Let's look at verse 8 as it ties into this. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Leave that there for a second, Rachel. Go back, would you? Okay? If we claim to be without sin, if we claim to not be prideful, if we claim to not be comparison to others, if we claim not to have that list, if we claim to not to be without sin, it says you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in us. Okay? That's how it leads into this. So, if you're out there claiming that you're not a sinner, you're deceiving yourselves. So because of that, verse 9 then says, if we confess our sins then, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, verse 8 reminds us to not deceive ourselves. We all struggle with sin. If you're going to struggle with it, then what it says to do next, confess it. Don't just struggle with it. Confess it. I need to confess. You need to confess. What is confession? Well, confession is, first of all, not just complaining. right? If I'm merely reciting my problems to God and then whining about them, my struggle, that's not confessing. Confession is a, is a radical reliance on God's grace and then changing your behavior. Okay, It's not just talking about it. It's a radical reliance then on God's grace. I can't do this on my own. I depend on God's grace and only God's grace. And then you change your behavior. And maybe you need to do what I've had to do in the last few days. You just need to confess. Confess whatever it is you're struggling with. Confess whoever's on that list. Confess that pride and comparison may be eating away at you somewhere. And it's robbing you of some of the rewards that God would love to give you. And I'm telling you, God will hear your confession. Right? He, he, you will find a wonder in God's grace if you just confess. God, God's grace can create an honest confession if we give it, if we give it to Him, that confession, and His great grace can receive that confession from us as we do it. Guys, we gotta be so careful about this curse of comparison, about letting that work its way into our lives and weaken us spiritually and weaken us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do me a favor, bow your head and close your eyes with me. Um, and our worship team is going to come back up. Guys, this morning we're going to have a, just a, a simple little invitation. We're going to give you a chance if there's anything in your life that you need to confess. And I guarantee you a lot of us in this room, if not most of us, have something in our life we probably need to confess. 
If we're denying that we're struggling with anything, we're probably lying to ourselves. We're being dishonest with ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. So this morning, we're going to take some time. We're going to sing just a few verses, and, and we're going to give you the opportunity to come up, and you can just pray with God. Here at the altar, you can kneel down, confess whatever you need to confess to God. Maybe you need to come up and pray with someone. You can sure do that. Maybe pride, maybe this comparison thing has been something you've been struggling with. Well, man, today's a great day to come up and just lay it at the altar. Say, okay, God, I'm giving this up to you so that I can move on and move forward in my life and, and stop allowing this thing to rob the rewards you want to give me and to rob the blessings you want to give me. And, and maybe this morning you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your life. You don't have that relationship we've been talking about this morning. And if you want to do that this morning, my, I, I, I urge you today to not put it off, to not wait, but to come make that right with God today. And maybe you want to join our church family. Whatever decision it is you want to make in the next few moments, I just want to encourage you to do that. So if you'd stand with me as I pray, and then we're going to sing a few verses. So stand with me. God, I love you, Lord. Man, I love the, the conviction that you've given me in my own life when it comes to this area of comparison and pride. And it's so easy to get there spiritually, in life in general, just to get start comparing ourselves and be prideful. And it, it'll infect all areas of our life. So God, I pray for each one of us in this room that if we're dealing with this, that you would um, convict us a little bit, God. Help us to know we need to confess, confess this to you and to kind of clear this out of our lives and try to move forward in our lives so that you can bless us the way you want to bless us. God, it's tough sometimes to live in a world um, and not compare and not to get to the point where we have haughty eyes, the top of that list of sins, God, that you you hate. God, don't let us just brush this off like it's not a big deal. Help us to realize it's a big deal to you and should be, should be a big deal to us. So the next few moments, God, as we sing, that you would um, touch our hearts, um, allow us to bring these things to you that we need to bring to you, God, and to lay this at your altar. God, we love you. Thank you for, for loving us and for wanting us to change in our lives. And we give all these things to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus for the cleansing. Are you washed in the blood of Jesus? Are you fully trusting in His grace? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? In the soul of the land, are you washed in the blood of the land? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the land? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you guarded in the spotless of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Hey, if you be seated for a second. Um, I know Steve's got some announcements to make. We'll take the offering, and we got one more thing we're going to do here at the end of the service. So, Steve, use that microphone. All right. Good morning. Thanks for that message. A wonderful message today. So we have quite a few announcements. Um, don't forget to turn in your welcome cards. So uh, as Randy talked about earlier, the cards that are in the seats in front of you, fill those out and turn them in. Um, on the back of the note sheets uh, that were in your bulletin this morning, um, you'll see all the help that's needed for the Easter weekend. Um, setting up for Journey to the Cross, um, that'll be on the Saturday, no, I'm sorry, on the Sunday after potluck, after April 13th. Um, Easter eggs for the Easter egg hunt. Uh, Easter pancake breakfast and Rick and Tony are organizing this so volunteers to help out with this uh, see them specifically but they're looking for six people to help serve need people to bring syrup butter and orange juice and 
we want to let you know that all the proceeds from that breakfast will go to the VBS this summer. So raise your hand, Rick and Tony. Uh, see them about Easter uh, Sunday morning. Um, there is going to be a slight charge for that, $3 per person, so be prepared. No more than $12 for family for that breakfast. Um, our men's prayer breakfast, next one will be next Saturday at 7, so we encourage all the guys to show up for that. Um, there's a VBS luncheon next Sunday after church. Um, today there's a cleaning team meeting after church, uh, so those of you that can volunteer to help clean the church, please uh, stay and join us for that in room two, okay? And um, on Saturday, April 12th, we're going to have another Spick and Span Community Day uh, from 10 to 1, and uh, that's going to be out in the community this time, so um, make sure that uh, if you are available that day to come in, and I'm, I'm sure we'll learn more about that probably next Sunday as far as what we'll be doing and where we'll be going, okay? And let's see. Uh, Delta County Young Life Red Carpet Event, uh, May 2nd of 2014. That's coming up. Uh, there's a few of these cards available, I think, on the Welcome Center. And then next weekend, you should have some of these cards in your bulletins uh, to prepare for the uh, that red carpet event. So you can talk to Ty about that. Uh, and don't forget your monthly calendar. Um, everything is coming up this month. And... We're going to have the ushers come forward and take the offering, and uh, then we'll have our last uh, morning event. Not so much enthusiasm, guys. Please chill a little bit, okay? Let's go to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day the blessings that you've given us. We just thank you for your word, and I pray that we've heard your word, that we would uh, take it seriously. For We know that uh, you've given it to us to be used. I praise you and thank you for the blessings that you continually pour out upon us. Thank you for the opportunity of returning a portion of what you've blessed us with, that your work would be carried out in the way that would bring glory and honor to you. For we know that our purpose here is to glorify you, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was watching a video in Sunday school recently. The uh, man presenting it said that he's, he was thinking about, as he was meditating on who God was and what he had done for us, he was reminded about the words to a chorus that he was familiar with, and then he recited the words to this chorus. You join us as you give your offering. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 